I'd like to begin by invoking the dictionary. I was particularly pleased when earlier today a very fine lecture was given on the Constitution and also invoked the dictionary. And I found that uh, a lot of times the people who respect the Constitution also respect the dictionary. I've also found that a lot of times theologians and maybe other leftists uh, don't respect the dictionary. But uh, I've really been uh, surprised and amazed at how the medical regulation industry actually takes a caterpillar and completely runs over the dictionary. So the dictionary is very useful in uh, facilitating the exchange of thoughts and ideas. And uh, so I'd like to drill down on, um, on one of the dictionary words. It's not used very much anymore, but it's a very important word because uh, this word, this, this word describes really the problems that we have virtually all over the world today, is that there are too many malefactors running around loose. Um, there are two types of malefactors as described by the dictionary. Uh, one is type one, is an evildoer one who commits a crime, one subject to public prosecution, and uh, a criminal. And type two is one who does not commit crimes, although uh, he's an evil person, okay? Uh, at first glance, you might think that the medical regulation industry might be confined to type two. But let me share with you a little story about Dr. Charles Denham, who was a physician like you and me, but he was very attracted to the patient safety movement. And so he ditched his medical practice, he started a foundation, and he joined the patient safety lecture circuit, was talking all over the country about patient safety and all the rest. He made a few well-placed contributions and suddenly found himself as co-chair of one of the very important committees at the National Quality Forum, the NQF. And there, he very carefully shepherded one of the formulations that was really a monopoly of care fusion. And this is a skin cleanser, and he got that label of quality applied to this special formulation. And lo and behold, care fusion was in to make not only millions, but tens of millions and probably hundreds of millions, I don't know, maybe billions. But here, care fusion hit a bonanza. The only problem was that the U.S. Department of Justice heard about this. And uh, the U.S. Department of Justice was not happy with the 10 point, no, no, it was $11.6 million kickback, as they described it, that Care Fusion had paid Dr. Denham for his efforts. And so the U.S. Department of Gen uh, Justice decided that this was a crime worthy of a $40.1 million fine to care fusion. So uh, you might think that, uh, yeah, maybe there is some connection here with the patient safety industry, but what about the medical regulation industry? Well, it so happens that Dr. Christine Castle, the immediate uh, past CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine, happens to now be the CEO of National Quality Forum. So here is the MOC, MOL business all embroiled in this kind of scandal. And a year or so ago, uh, they were all running for cover. And Christine Castle herself, it turned out, had a lot of undisclosed conflicts of interest herself. And so they were trying to cover up for each other and maybe throw each other under the bus. It was a, it was a real interesting scenario. But now you don't hear about this anymore. Uh, I've actually published an, un well, I have not published, it's an unpublished article that describes this criminal connection to this group of people. And if any of you are interested in this, uh, please see me later. At any rate, um, we're going to talk about the Federation of State Medical Boards, and it's composed of 70 different state medical boards of medicine and osteopathy. And this is where it lives, uh, just around the corner from the DFW airport at a place called Useless Texas. Yes, that's the correct pronunciation, uh, just like the products that they peddle. The board is made up of uh, not just doctors, but also people from other professions, even lawyers. And uh, here is one of their directors at large, an associate member, uh, a lawyer. And uh, so he's in charge of doing what? Of uh, 
they're in the medical testing business. They test doctors, and so here we have. Uh, of course, they might have, he might have done well to use the dictionary because of a sup superfluous K that's attached to his name. But uh, this is the CEO of the organization, Dr. Humayun Chaudhry. And uh, Dr. Chaudhry is a, is a physician, he's a, he's a DO, and uh, it should be uh, noted, because the terminology is a little bit hard to follow here, but Dr. Chaudhry is the president and CEO, and he's the permanent fixture there. But they have, a, on a rotating basis, they have a new chair that comes along. They call this person the chairperson or chairman that comes along and rotates periodically. Uh, a new chairperson. So they have two uh, people who basically are responsible for running the organization. Well, Dr. Chaudhry is the CEO, and this is their most recent IRS Form 990, and it shows there at the bottom, you can't see it very well, but his uh, annual compensation is just a little over, right around plus or minus 629000 a year. So he does pretty well for himself. This is their business, and and they're in the business of medical testing. So the more tests, the more examinations they can offer physicians and uh, submit uh, physicians to, the more money they make. And you can see, maybe you can't see, that $47 million a year is what they get in revenue on a yearly basis for their testing. Now, they had decided a few years ago that they were going to implement what they called maintenance of licensure. And this is really a requirement then that each state would be uh, requiring a physician in order to relicense in the state to participate with medical uh, maintenance of certification. And so they wrote this article, and uh, it's entitled, Maintenance of Licensure Evolving from Framework to Implementation. And the authors provide a report uh, summarizing the progress that was made by uh, the board and uh, I guess they made this after uh, or around April of 2010. Um, they had also written another article that's highlighted down there, maintenance of licensure, uh, protecting the public and promoting quality health care. Well, these are, this is very, very common terminology. You see this all the time. They like to use that kind of terminology. And of course, the lead author was Dr. Chaudhry himself. It describes up here uh, how they had formulated a group to implement this, and they call it the MOL Implementation Group that was to implement this uh, maintenance of licensure. Dr. Chaudhry likes to talk about these various components of MOL, and he describes these uh, as reflective self-assessment, whatever that is, assessment of knowledge and skills, uh, whatever that is, and performance and practice. And he also is very fond of this term, lifelong learning, as if the rest of us don't do any lifelong learning. But in actuality, he's the one who doesn't do any lifelong learning because he doesn't participate in maintenance certification himself. Well, uh, a few, uh, maybe it was a couple years ago, um, we had in Ohio, a very prominent uh, physician who not only had been uh, president of the Ohio State Medical Association, but he'd also been a delegate to the AMA and also been involved in, uh, he had been a board member of the Ohio State Medical Board for many years, and he had been promoted to be uh, the chairperson of the, uh, of the FSMB, okay? And this is Dr. Lance Talmage. And, uh, we had at one time uh, in Ohio, thanks to the OSMA, the Ohio State Medical Association, a, a forum in which physicians could exchange different thoughts and ideas and uh, problems. And uh, here is a question that one of the uh, participants in the forum had about why some of the FSMB leaders don't themselves participate. And uh, it's a very good question, actually. And uh, Dr. Talmage responds, and uh, he indicated that, what? That they had a special program for those involved in these kinds of uh, non-clinical activities. They have a special program for them. Well, I responded, and my response was a little bit irreverent. 
And uh, I said, thank you, Dr. Talmadge, for this important revelation. So the president of the FSMB can determine that he is non-clinically active and therefore have for himself an appropriate continuing professional development as an alternative. In other words, the chieftains of the FSMB and any other doctor regulatory agency can easily escape the expense and time-consuming MOC, MOL process. And uh, I went on and said a few other things that apparently they didn't appreciate too much because Dr. Talmadge is a very important member of the uh, Re Medical Regulatory Committee and uh, process. And uh, so it wasn't too long after that that they shut this forum down. And uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I ought to take the entire blame for that because Dr. Paul Kempen was doing a lot more posting than I was, and so maybe he should share the blame. But uh, anyway, Dr. Chaudhry apparently doesn't participate, well, he doesn't participate in, in MOC, but even more interesting than that, and I never would have thought of this myself, but uh, Dr. Herring, a very good plastic surgeon from North Carolina, decided he would take it a little step further. And he uh, noticed that Dr. Chaudhry likes to run around the country and talking of himself and promoting of himself as a clinical associate professor of internal medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. And so this is listed in several places. And so he decided he'd inquire uh, of the Texas Medical Board to see if, he, in fact, Dr. Chaudhry had a license to practice medicine. I mean, I would have assumed that he probably did. It turns out that the Texas Medical Board had no record of Dr. Chaudhry even applying for a license. And he lives right there around the corner from the DFW airport. Here they met this, they started this MOL implementation group. They, this was back in February of 2011. And so they were going to implement MOL for all the rest of us, even though Dr. Chaudhry doesn't even have a medical license in Texas. And uh, so this was a facilitated group uh, being led by a, uh, a former senior program officer from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And there were other people who weren't physicians on this group. There was, uh, uh, I think, a physician assistant. Uh, there was a lawyer from, Tex from Ohio who actually was at that time the executive secretary, the executive director of the Ohio State Medical Board, and his name was Richard Whitehouse. And Richard Whitehouse was well known for some of his articles, and he wrote this article, Maintenance of Licensure, Medical Regulation with a Sheathed Sword. It sounds a little scary, and uh, I don't have time to read all of the stuff that he wrote, but uh, he claimed that Ohio needs more regulation in order to do even more. He's talking about using this sheathed sword in order to uh, discipline physicians. Now, I want to go on. Uh, to uh, another very prominent individual in the medical regulatory industry, and this is Dr. James Stockman. He was uh, at one time the uh, CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics. And uh, in one year, he earned, uh, he did quite a bit better than Dr. Chaudhry. He got $1.2 million in compensation for his efforts on the uh, Board of Pediatrics. And uh, the Board of Pediatrics, you might note, that is, was the first board that uh, instituted continuous MOC, maintenance of certification. And uh, Dr. Stockman, and I might mention that there is an interrelationship here with all of these medical regulators from all these different organizations. They sort of shift around from, from place to place. Uh, but uh, he uh, quit his job there to do something else. And I'll just mention with some of his money, he likes to collect vintage cars. Here's his car collection. And uh, his wife maintained that uh, maybe in a year's time he would sell, buy or sell 30, 40, 50 cars. That's a lot of cars. You know, I think he should have been a car dealer. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, when you make that much money, I guess you can afford to have a car collection like this. So what he does now is he heads up this uh, entity called Data Commons. Now, Data Commons was formed by a number of different so-called nonprofit organizations, and it was formed by uh, the American Board of Family Medicine, the American Board of Pediatrics, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, and of course, the Federation of State Medical Boards, and the National Board of Medical Examiners. 
And all, they, all these joined together to form this group. Now, these were nonprofit organizations, mind you, and, and here they are forming Data Commons, which is a for-profit corporation. Now, what's Data Commons doing? Well, Data Commons is going to be and is in the business of collecting data on all physicians. So all of this data is being sent to Data Commons, and it's a for-profit company, and they are going to be charging for all of this data. So whenever you go to apply for a license and you need data, you're going to be paying good money to them. And uh, I think... I think that there's a lot here that needs to be investigated. Okay, I'm sorry, but when you have a nonprofit organization that has a subsidiary that's for profit and you have people earning the kinds of money that these people tend to, I mean, somebody needs to look into this. And uh, we, need to, we, we need to do that. Um, so here we get to the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Does anybody know why we have the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact? Why, why, why did it come around? Does anybody know? We beat them at MOL. We beat them at MOL, and so now they, they realize that they couldn't continue going down that route. And do you know why we beat them at MOL? Where's Dr. Heeb, Dr. Lee Heeb? Is she here? She's not here? Okay. Well, we need to thank Dr. Heeb for what she did. Um, Here's how it happened. And when I think about this, it, it, it frightens me because we came this close to having MOL today that would have started in Ohio and would have spread easily to all the other states. And this is how it happened. They had Ohio listed as one of the pilot states. They had about, I think, maybe eight different states that were considered pilot states. And um, I didn't realize this at the time, but. Of course, they had Dr. Chaudhry, who was president of FSNB. They had Lance Talmage, who was the, I'm sorry, he was the CEO. Lance Talmage was the chairman. And then they had the incoming president of the Ohio State Medical Association, who was a good friend of theirs and who had been previously president of the Ohio State Medical Board. So they had everything lined up for Ohio to be the pilot state. Not one of them, but the pilot state. And I wasn't aware of this. Now, a few years ago, Dr. Lee Heeb was finishing her term as president of AAPS, and it was my turn to get off the board. And AAPS, I've been on the board for a long time, and, and it was my turn to take a leave. And it's a good practice that we have, because we need to get some of these old guys off the board, get new blood in. So I, I agree with that policy. And it so happened that Dr. Heeb decided, uh, I'm not sure I want to be the immediate uh, past president on the board, and I tried to talk to her and convince her that she needed to stay there, and she wouldn't listen to me, but that's okay, nobody else does anyway. Um, but uh, she decided that she didn't want to serve as immediate past president, and the board asked me to do that. And I did. And what happened next is that the very next board meeting, which was in Las Vegas, uh, there was Ron Benbasat, who was a real giant in this MOC movement, and he was sharing his love or lack thereof toward MOC and the medical regulators. And um, he said something that I was not aware of. And here, I'm a delegate to the Ohio State Medical Association. I wasn't aware that they had intended and they were planning to implement MOL in the very near future. And uh, I wasn't aware of that. And this is how sneaky they can get these things through. And so I took a flight back uh, that Saturday night all night flight back to Dayton. The next day, I called Paul Kempen. And uh, Paul was not a member of the Ohio State Medical Association, but he was a, he, he's another giant, in the, as you know, in this anti-MOC, MOL movement. And Paul, bless his heart, decided that he would join the OSMA just to fight this issue. And so I drafted a, a resolution that opposed MOL uh, that day and turned it in the next day, which was the deadline. So I had minutes to spare before I turned this resolution in. And at that House of Delegate meeting, uh, Paul and I together, we fought this thing on the floor of the House of Delegates and we won. We won with a few little exceptions, you know, they modified some of the language, but it's okay because we had things on our side, we had things planned out. And it was very interesting to see how the president of the OSMA finally was forced to actually oppose MOL. 
And that's how it started. And then from there, we went to ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. We got them to approve a resolution that condemned MOL, as well as MOC. And uh, we got some of you, and some of you did wonderful work in your own states. And lo and behold, the FSMB decided, hey, we, we can't continue this. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. And uh, so they, you know, this MOL drive just went away. But I knew they would be back. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, but I knew they were coming back. And, um, and you know, they're like pesky mosquitoes. You know, if you don't swat them dead, they keep circling and circling until they'll land on you again. And so they came back. And what did they come back with? They came back with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. And what did they do? They threw the dictionary away and they, de de they defined things the way they wanted to. Uh, the first thing they did was they defined physician as one who holds specialty certification or a time unlimited specialty certificate recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties or the American Osteopathic Association's Bureau of Osteopathic Specialists. Have you ever heard of a doctor being, a physician being defined this way before? I, I, it's never been done. But yet this is, who gives them the power to define who, what a physician is? What authority do they have? Uh, they also just arbitrarily define the location of where the physician-patient encounter takes place. And instead of it being the, look, the state in which the physician is present, they make it where the patient is. Again, what gives them the authority to decide these things? This is a blatant confiscation of power and authority of the states because the states have their own medical uh, boards and they should be the ones defining who and where and all these locations are. And they are simply uh, taking that responsibility to themselves. Now, there are all kinds of other issues, and it's about a 20, I don't know, 20, between 20 and 30 pages long, and we don't have time to go through all of the problems that this whole um, interstate medical licensure compact has brought to us. But we'll talk a little bit in just a minute about some of those uh, issues that have been identified by some of the other boards that have resisted. Uh, one of the things that is very, very bothersome to me is that the FSMB has received a $225,000 grant from HRSA from taxpayer money going to a nonprofit organization to implement the Interstate Compact. To me, this is the very definition of fascism, where you're taking state money, public money, taxpayer money, and you're funneling it into an organization that is in the business of making profits for themselves. And, uh, and I think this is absolutely a horrible uh, disgrace that, uh, that violates the Constitution. Uh, federal entities have no right, no authority to dispense, uh, disperse money of this, in this way. Um, here recently, uh, there has been a drive to support telemedicine, which is really what is the excuse of the FSMB for bringing us this compact in the first place. But there has been a uh, drive, a, a bill that's been introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, which... Uh, was previously proposed in 2013, but what it does is it provides for a physician to be able to provide care for Medicare patients without having to get another license. And so, and so here you have an idea that circumvents the authority of the FSMB. And it's really driven by the federal government that uh, says that physician doesn't have to have a a license in another state if he's doing or he, if she is doing telemedicine. It's a little bit messy from a constitutional perspective because, you know, again, when you see the federal government getting involved with uh, something that is in the realm of the state's authority, uh, it's not quite right. But we need to support this bill anyway, even if it isn't quite constitutional, because nobody else pays attention to the Constitution. And one of the main reasons is that both the American Medical Association as well as the Federation of State Medical Boards oppose this bill. 
Now, if the American Medical Association opposes this bill, we can be virtually certain that we ought to be on the other side. Uh, if the Federation of State Medical Boards opposes this bill, we can be absolutely certain that we should be on the other side. So, so we need to uh, support this bill. And of course, Dr. Chaudhry claims that this is an issue of patient safety. Oh, really? I thought he was in favor of telemedicine. Uh, well, not quite. Uh, only if they can promote this interstate compact, which of course will mean that the FSMB will have control over the, F over the interstate compact, okay? So Dr. Chaudhry says that, this organ uh, that his organization opposes the bill because of concern about patient safety. The compact is, compact is a way to preserve a state-based regulation and the ability of state boards to protect patients and to follow up when there are issues that go wrong, while at the same time addressing access to care and supporting new technology. Uh, unbelievable. So far, as of August 18, there are 11 states that have actually enacted legislation to uh, enter into this compact. Most of these states are relatively, well, low population states, except for maybe Illinois, uh, which was the last one to join. They initially decided they needed seven states, and they've got their seven states already. But the game isn't over yet. The FSMB doesn't like to talk about some of the states that have decided against it. And, uh, you know, there may be a few more states that enact this legislation. Uh, could be, but that's okay. Uh, but what about the states that have uh, decided that they don't want the, um, the uh, interstate compact? One of the states is Texas, the home state of, uh, uh, of the FSMB. But Texas decided, hey, we're not going to bring this to a vote. And now they have to wait for at least two years if they want to bring it up again. And there was a strong drive in Texas, if you can imagine. And the FSMB right there in their home state. And it's not going to go anywhere in Texas, at least for two years. What about Missouri? Missouri, the State Medical Board of Missouri, their general counsel has, has read the bill. You know, congratulations to her. And she very, very ably points out the problems with it. And this is what she says. She says, there are many who will not qualify for the compact licensure, including those who are not board certified, those with a past criminal history, even a relatively minor history, and those with past disciplinary history, including things like a reprimand for failure to obtain required CME, or an HB 600 suspension for failure to pay taxes. The compact will not assist these individuals with portability of licensure, she says. She's read it, she knows, she understands. She also says the compact also takes away the state's autonomy and authority to grant licenses. And she continues, as I understand it, part of the emphasis for the compact was to make having multiple state licenses easier for physicians. This provision does not do that and arguably complicates it, uh, the idea of having multiple licenses even further. The renewal provisions require the licensees to still comply with each state's renewal process, but insert the commission as a middleman in the re renewal process. It will add another layer of bureaucracy and another potential fee to the process. One significant difference between current law in Missouri and law in many other states is suspensions. In general, courts in Missouri are reluctant to uphold a deprivation of private property rights, like the right to a professional license without a pre-deprivation hearing. In some states, the board can suspend a license without a hearing being held prior to the suspension. It is unclear if the hearing in the other state, assuming there was one, would meet this requirement to discipline the Missouri license. It's true. You know, a, a licensee in one state can completely lose his or her uh, ability to properly represent himself or herself. You know, it, it, this can be a real mess as far as any disciplinary hearing is concerned. And states can certainly lo lose their jurisdiction 
uh, over the matter. As far as costs are concerned, the Interstate uh, Compact Commission, she says, has the power to charge an annual assessment to the state boards. The startup costs, which could be passed on to the state boards, will be significant. In addition to the fees paid by the participating states, the licenses, uh, licensees will also pay fees to the Interstate Compact Commission. It is likely that there will be fees for initial qualification under the compact for charging the state of prison per licensure and for renewal. Additional fees might include mandated use of the Federation Credentialing Verification System, FCVS. Well, yes, that's going to be for, and they're going to, Currently charge, they're currently charging at least $350. They're going to make a lot of money on this. And where is it going to go? Uh, probably to Data Commons. Um, and where do you find out uh, about Data Commons? You know, that's a for-profit group, remember. We're not going to be able to find any information out on them. They could also mandate the use of the FSMB uniform application, which currently costs $50. In addition to any fees set by the Interstate Com Compact Commission, states will continue to charge licensure fees. So this whole fee business is going to be out of control. It's going to cost a lot of money to set this thing up. It's going to be a huge expense. Now, what about Ohio? Uh, I've got to tell you, uh, this last uh, annual meeting at the Ohio State uh, Medical Association House of Delegates, I introduced two resolutions. Well. I introduced one. one, another one came from another part of the state, but I wrote it. And uh, the first one, and you'll have it in your packets, so maybe you should dig out these resolutions in your packets right now, because here's work that each of you have to do. <laughs> um, but there, there are actually three resolutions in there. The, one of the resolutions is actually one that we have taken to ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and we have asked ALEC to approve and, and to, um, to take a position opposing the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which is what we have. Okay, the other two resolutions have to do with the Ohio State Medical Association, and one of them has to do with opposing the Interstate Compact. And then uh, the third one has to do with leaving the FSMB. Now this is what we have to do to kill FSMB. They have their component medical societies in each state. We've got to get at least one state to say, no, we're not going to be part of FSMB anymore. Maybe Missouri, maybe Texas, maybe even Ohio. And uh, so we've got to get our states out of FSMB. We've got, to, we've got to permanently neutralize FSMB. Okay, we don't want this thing coming back at us again and again and again. We've got to, get, we, we've got to deal with this now. So, so anyway, I wrote these two resolutions to my own state medical society. And, uh, I was able to actually be on the reference committee, but even at that, uh, the resolutions didn't, uh, didn't pass. But that's okay. You know, we, 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 have, to, we have to recognize that we're going to fail at these. Some, you know, but it's okay. But you know what happened is somehow or other, I think the Ohio State Medical Board got wind of this. And they saw, huh, there's a move for us to, to leave the FSMB. There's also a move against the interstate compact. Maybe we better read it. And so what they did is they came out with uh, this report. And it says, uh, well, there are multiple reasons why they do not plan to be part of the interstate compact. Now, this is from the state medical board that had been the pilot state, the pilot state to institute MOL. And now they're saying they're not going to be part of this interstate compact. So these activities at our state medical boards and the, license and the, and the uh, legislatures do pay off. And even though they may not, may not always appear to be successful, they're things that we have to do. And so uh, what are their reasons? Ohio says loss of self-determination. The compact would remove the Ohio Medical Board Board's authority to regulate its licensees. That's very true. And they also say financial issues, the compact would impose duties without providing for appropriate funding to the Ohio Board. And legal concerns, it may not be completely legal. Additional bureaucracy problems, you know, with this whole thing of setting up another compact, all of these reasons. And then they finally, I don't have time to go over all of this, but Ohio said, no, we're not going to do it. Now, we have to win again. And we will win again. And that's because of all of you. 
And all of you need to take these resolutions. Take the one from ALEC, from the American Legislative Exchange Council. Take it to your state legislators, especially in those states that have already passed this, and especially in states that are still considering it. And your conservative legislators at least know about ALEC and respect ALEC. And also take these other resolutions to your medical associations in your, in your different states. Have them introduced and have the one that calls for elimination of their state medical board from the FSMB. Have that introduced, have the other one introduced that opposes the interstate compact. And so the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna write letters to all these doctors in these states that already have the interstate compact. And we're gonna say, look, this is why we don't want you, we don't think it's in your best interest to join the compact. If you need a license, get it through the usual way. Don't go through the compact because you're gonna put yourself at risk. It's gonna cost you a lot of money. You're gonna be at risk for your medical license, for MOC, for all kinds of problems. It's not gonna be worth it to you. Don't do it. And we'll give them all the reasons why they shouldn't. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a big operation, sending letters to all these people, but we'll do it. And then maybe a month later, we'll send letters to the legislators in all this state all these states and we'll say, look, you know, go ahead and join the compact if you want. It's going to be expensive to you. Uh, we're enclosing here a little information about some of the states who have decided, they've actually read this and they've decided that it's going to be costly. It's going to be hard to extricate themselves from it. And I said, you know, this is what's going to happen is you're going to have a framework here that nobody's going to use. And then you're going to have to respond to your taxpayers and you're going to say, you know, it, we've wasted all this money and we have something that you know, has been completely useless. And uh, you know, I think the legislators are gonna get the drift that this is something that they don't wanna have any part in because it's gonna come back to bite them. So these are things that we need to do and we will do. And we need all of you to get together and implement these things uh, with your own state medical associations in your states, because this is important. It's not palatable work, okay? I tell you, you know, to argue some of these resolutions in front of the House of Delegates is, is you know, they, some, some of the people don't like it and, and they're afraid and, and uh, sometimes they, they, they don't go along with us, but it does pay in the, wrong, in the long run. It really is effective. And uh, so it's something that we have to do and we will win. And let's remember that we need to permanently neutralize FSMB so that they don't keep coming back at us over and over and over again. Thank you so much.